We'll start off with uh, Nicholas Pick, Professor Nicholas Pickwood. Uh, each speaker has uh, uh, 10 minutes. Nicholas contributed with two contributions and uh, will give him uh, 20 minutes to uh, present his work today. And when uh, we are going to get to about one minute left, I will ring a little bell to know, let know, the speaker know that uh, it's one minute to go. And uh, hope everybody enjoys. Professor Nicola Pickford trained in bookbinding and book conservation with Roger Powell and ran his own workshop from 1977 to 1989 and has been advisor on book conservation to a national trust since 1978. He was chief conservator in the Harvard University Library from 1992 to 1995 and remains project leader of the St. Catherine's Monastery Library Project based at the University of the Arts London where, until 2019, he was director of the Ligatus Research Center, which is dedicated to the history of bookbinding. He also teaches courses in the UK, Europe, and America on the history of European bookbinding in the era of hand printing press, and has published widely on the subject. He also supervised PhD research into the history of bookbinding. For the JPC volume, he wrote a biographic piece on Christopher Clarkson and a piece on Italian lace case paper bindings. Nicholas, screen is yours. Okay, thank you. I cannot share it while somebody else is part, another participant. Sorry, that's my, that's my fault. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> there. Okay. Okay, I hope everybody can see that and uh, it is enormously pleasing to have so many of you listening from so many different parts of the world. Uh, I don't think, certainly I have never spoken to such an international audience that is still actually international. Uh, I, they're, they're where they live because we can't go anywhere else. Um, so uh, it falls to me to, to open the proceedings and I thought the best thing I could do really to talk about Chris because many of you knew him, uh, all of you will know of him is to make it a little more personal perhaps than, than uh, biographical in the, so far as his career is concerned. Um, and to, uh, if I can find out how to, yeah, there we go. Start at the beginning, as it were, with Chris as a, a scout on the right-hand side there uh, in the 1930s. Um, I don't know that you can see the future conservator in him, but I think on the one on the right with his bicycle, you can, because at that stage, he was beginning this obsessive pursuit of everything that was of interest to him. Uh, in this case, brass rubbings in medieval churches, which he bicycled around um, from an early age. And uh, according to Una, at least, used to send his washing back to his mother in a uh, parcel to have it done while he was traveling around uh, England, taking brass rubbings. But he became fascinated by the Middle Ages at a very early age. And that fascination never left him, and particularly the fascination with uh, heraldry. And the heraldry, I think, has a, a very important part to play in the, in the work that he came to do later in his life, because he became uh, very uh, knowledgeable about her heraldic language, the terminology of, of the heraldry, which was intended to be completely clear, precise, and unmistakable. And Chris agonized for the rest of his life over trying to find clear, unmistakable, precise terms for all the things he was trying to describe. And some of those he remained, some of the heraldic terms remained with him. Terms like engrailed, for instance, for a scalloped edge of a line that comes from heraldry. Uh, the saltar cross for Italian secondary tackets, uh, that comes from, from heraldry as well. So he, he had a, a, a lifelong interest in what became his interest, even though at the time he didn't know it. Um, and it is by one of those happy accidents that he first became interested in bookbinding, particularly at the Royal College, when he went into what he thought was an empty room to do some work, because uh, he was studying the graphic arts at that point, um, and found a room full of books bound by Peter Waters, who came in and asked him what he was doing, and they started talking, and Chris ended up adding bookbinding to his degree, uh, and the bookbinding then obviously took over, but it also 
created a link with Peter Waters, which was a very important part of his professional life uh, thereafter. Um, and it was the result that he ended up uh, for a while in, in America. Um, photographs of him in America as a, a much younger man than most of us uh, will have remembered seeing him. Uh, the presence of hair on the top of his head will come as a shock to many. Um, a very characteristic portrait on the left, which is perspiration. Chris was uh, famous for his perspiration. Uh, and seeing him in the monastery at St. Catherine's in the desert heat was a, a, a truly alarming sight sometimes. But that was uh, part of his persona really for those of us who came to know him. But he, he started as a graphic artist. Um, he was very particular about the appearance of things and that characterized his work all the way through. The, things the work that he did had to look good as well as be good. Um, and his handwriting, this very elegant italic script that he wrote all his notes in, uh, absolutely characteristic and unmistakable. Um, and the way that tools and everything else had to be just right and perfect for what they needed to do. Um, and although this may have frustrated many other people working with him uh, because he had such high standards, it's those high standards that made him the conservator that he became. The most formative experience of his life, professional life, and that of many others, uh, of course, were the floods in Florence in 1966. Uh, an event which brought together so many conservators from across the world um, for the meeting, I suspect, probably for the first time in that sort of, well, certainly in that sort of situation, but any situation, and opened all their eyes to the extraordinary quantity of material that was sitting in libraries because suddenly they had to deal with it, um, literally shelves full of it, uh, digger loads of it, scooping books out of the basements uh, of the buildings that were flooded. And for Chris, it started a lifelong engagement with the book on the left-hand side, <clears throat> limp vellum bindings, um, lace case parchment bindings as he came to call them. Um, and the one actually there, I think, I'm not entirely sure those are his hands or not. They certainly look like his thumbs. Um, <clears throat> I suspect they are his, uh, <clears throat> is the one really that started him off. He saw a book of great simplicity and very high quality in terms of design. Um, and this fascinated him. And also the fact that these books survived the floods in better condition than many of the more elaborately bound books. And this sparked an interest in him, which, which he carried forward into this uh, remarkable essay he wrote on limp vellum the wooden case where they still are, um, and began the process of elevating the humble to the heights, as it were. He took very simple books made by binders who knew their materials, knew what they were doing, um, and had a lot to teach us in terms of what we do. And these books became known as conservation bindings, much to his distress, because it wasn't a term that he liked very much. Um, but it showed the structure, of course, which was part of the tradition in which he himself had worked. Um, his relationship with Roger Powell, above all, Sandy Cockrell, um, introduced him to the, the arts and crafts movement, the idea of structure and materials being predominant in the manufacture of a book, and also plugged him into that tradition with Cobden Sanderson and Douglas Cockerell um, behind him as well. And he took it instead of going into the fine bindings, which he could certainly do, and he made some very beautiful bindings uh, at this per early period of his life, um, but I don't think did much of that work uh, thereafter, he was became entirely convinced, uh, uh, concentrated on conservation work. My introduction to him came first with Roger Powell. Um, when I was an apprentice at Roger Powell's workshop and this uh, man visited from America, this uh, luminary from across the ocean arrived and talked nonstop for several hours, it probably could have been several days for all I remember, it just went on and on, the endless conversation. Um, but I first became involved with him professionally at a National Trust property called Sudbury Hall. And this photograph was taken of him there um, in the early 80s when there was a flood in the house and a lot of uh, 17th and 18th century Italian bindings got badly uh, wet, soaked by a burst pipe above the library. And I was very new to this business and asked him if he could come and <clears throat> help me deal with it. There were probably five or 6,000 flooded books. And it was my first introduction to uh, freeze drying, which was a very new technology at that time. Um, and we managed to get the really badly damaged books uh, freeze dried, 
Um, and Chris was instrumental in doing that. And this, I, I got to see him at work for the first time and it uh, cemented a friendship which lasted all uh, the rest of his life. Um, but here he is, uh, I'm not quite sure what he's thinking about. Uh, the bust on the table, I think slightly beneath him to have all this going on around him, but a very characteristic picture of Chris, always with the pencils and pens tucked into his top pocket. <clears throat> he was never, never without them. Our own professional relationship became uh, much stronger, obviously, after the work started in the monastery uh, of St. Catherine on Mount Sinai. Uh, and the photograph in the middle there shows Chris working on a fragment of the Codex Sinaiticus, which he came over and wrote a, a report on for us, as well as the Codex Sinaiticus Syriacus, um, two very important documents for the conservation of the library. Uh, and subsequently went out to do work on uh, flattening the leaves that had been discovered uh, during building works in the 1970s. Um, the one on the left is one of my favorite pictures of Chris. It's Chris communing with the goat, uh, actually a hair sheep it turns out, uh, because it was with these animals we discovered what was a sheep and what was a goat when they were alive. Um, and the, I think the goat is as interested in, or the hair sheep I should say, is as interested in Chris as Chris is in it. Um, and uh, he took many, many photographs of these animals, uh, which are logged away in his archive. On the right hand side, an unusual photograph of Chris on a camel, um, slightly blurred because I was on the camel behind um, and therefore not the steadiest of platforms to take a picture from. Going up to the crest of Mount Sinai uh, with Nick Hagraft as well, um, as you will see here. Um, Nick, a student of Chris's uh, and a close friend of his thereafter <clears throat> and worked a lot together. Um, and they were both on this trip. We were both worried that we, whether Chris would survive the climb to the summit. And very sadly, it was Nick uh, who died a few years later himself um, and a great shame and a great loss to the world of book conservation. But they are there at, on the crest of Mount Sinai um, recovering. Uh, greatly pleased to discover you could get miniature Mars bars up there as well uh, and a cup of tea, which Chris greatly appreciated. Teaching is another hugely important part of his life. And I put this in Yedda to, to show him uh, in Ljubljana. Um, and I think Chris was always disappointed that he never had the impact he thought he ought to have had. Uh, he never managed to convert the world to his way of thinking. Um, but what he did do was teach an enormous number of people. And there's a great many conservators. I think most of the, the conservators in the Western world have been influenced directly or indirectly by what Chris was doing. Um, not only by his extraordinary practical skills, uh, but his commitment to what he was doing and this very powerful driving force behind him. And this uh, sense of the responsibility to what has gone past, um, to preserve what has survived from the past and to do it justice. Um, and using the materials, procuring the materials wherever possible, uh, to make this uh, achievable. Um, he knew and worked with a lot of people in the course of his life, uh, and I can't show all of them, I'll just show a few that I can have pictures of, and his Yerji Pnuchek, who you'll be hearing from later. And of course, perhaps the most important person who does not appear in his professional biography, his wife Una, uh, who provided a level of stability and tolerance and patience, which it is a, a remarkable to think about. Um, being married to an obsessive is never a, a happy, easy business, um, but Una survived it and provided this extraordinary uh, hospitality and welcome to all Chris's many friends who came to the house in Oxford here uh, from all over the world. A, a visit to Stanley Road was clearly a, an important part of anybody's visit to England who was involved in book conservation. Uh, and they were both extremely good and very welcoming hosts. And it was always a pleasure to be there. Um, I'm not quite sure whether that is wine. There is a wine bottle on the table. It seems a curiously pink color. Chris was not a great drinker, um, and, uh, but a great, uh, a very hospitable man. Another very important contact for Chris was uh, Jacques Brejou uh, at the uh, paper making classes that he gave. Um, and this picture of the two of them in, in obviously very serious conversation, I think is very characteristic. Um, of Chris and uh, a relationship that he had with Jacques, which was very uh, 
beneficial and very powerful to him because he, he had met a, a fellow craftsman who shared some of the same standards as him and wanted and was interested in procuring the materials that was, were made in the past. Uh, and particularly as far as I was concerned and in my next brief presentation, uh, the cartonnage found on the Italian bindings uh, and how this was made and how it could be made again to the same standards. But it's important to remember that Chris also uh, was quite capable of a good laugh. Uh, and I think this photograph on the left of him at the vat in the, um, the paper mill is a wonderful one of uh, just the sheer joy of being doing what he was doing. And somebody, I don't know what somebody had just said, but somebody had just said something clearly. And bottom right, we have Chris with another of his great companions, uh, colleagues, uh, Stuart Welsh, um, and who organized these classes um, in France and took Chris with him. And um, clearly the look on Chris's face is that of a person who is enjoying his work uh, as well as in being very good at his work. And Stuart did an enormous amount to help Chris with materials in particular through conservation by design, all the board materials and so on, which they worked on together. The sizes of the phase boxes and so on is, is a testament to the closeness with which they worked. I don't know what's happened to that sheet of paper. The, the sheet of paper made by Chris Clarkson must be a very important relic uh, of our profession. The last job that Chris worked on was the, the Winchester Bible. The Great Bible to be divided into four volumes. Um, and here is Chris working on it uh, on the first volume. During He began to get increasingly ill working on the second volume and, and had to withdraw from the work. Uh, and has since been finished by the conservators at Bodley with Andrew Honey. Um, but it was in a sense, it should have been the apex of his career, sadly uh, cut short by his illness. Um, but he carried on working for as long as it was possible for him to do so. Because I suspect work was what he did. Uh, it was the, the, the driving force in his life. And we managed to get, uh, and this I say we, it should really be um, Jocelyn Cumming who gets the credit for this because although I had the idea that he should be given a doctorate by uh, the University of the Arts, Camberwell being part of that, it was Jocelyn who badgered the authorities ceaselessly until they gave in and decided that actually this old student of theirs because his, his learning career started at the Camberwell School of Art, um, Arts and Crafts as it was in those days. And they agreed that he should be given an honorary doctorate, uh, an event which I'm very happy to, to, to know from Una gave him enormous pleasure. Um, and she said on the, on the bus on the way back to Oxford that evening, she said it was quite remarkable. He was almost happy, um, which, uh, a very characteristic remark from Una as well. His remark, of course, coming out of the hall, and that I should say too is his son Jon on the left hand side, um, as he came out of the hall, which was very, very hot, it's a midsummer degree ceremony. He said those Tudor people must have sweated an awful lot uh, because he was wearing his cap and his gown and everything else. And his first, in, first remark would be to relate it back to the Tudor period um, rather than anything else. And I thought that was very, uh, characteristic remark from him. We mourn this year again, of course, the death of Tony Keynes. Tony and Chris have been very close colleagues since Florence, um, constantly working with each other, a slight rivalry between them always um, as to who was doing what, um, which was a very productive rivalry. Uh, Tony, a superlative craftsman, and they could discuss tools as here and until they were forced to go to bed in the evening. I mean, it was just something which was a fascination to both of them. Um, and it's very sad to think of these two now, uh, both lost to us and all the, the knowledge and experience they've taken with them. And so we have Chris, uh, not actually in a monument. Uh, he is his own monument, I think, uh, but it seems a characteristic pose that Chris should be sitting, standing underneath a Gothic arch. Uh, he was a great lover of Gothic architecture. Um, and he deserves to be memorialized in some great Gothic building, I feel. Um, but his memory, of course, will, will live on with all of those of us who have learned from him. Uh, those of us who used to be able to pick up a telephone and ring Chris, I've got this problem, what do I do? And you would get an answer from Chris, you get interest, you would very often get a visit from him um, because he was extraordinarily selfless in his willingness to help other people. 
And I think that is one of his great, uh, well, one of the abiding memories I have of him that you could ask him that and you might get a few groans and moans uh, because he was full of groans and moans. Uh, so far as he was concerned, the world had been going to the dogs since the Romanesque period, which was the pinnacle of bookbinding and therefore the pinnacle of civilization. Uh, and everything else has was a falling away from that great uh, golden age. But uh, he would help everybody. Uh, and I found that a, an enormously pleasing characteristic of his. Um, and so many of us have benefited from it that it's difficult really to, to sum it up. Um, but I just thought it would be useful to start with some pictures of the man um, and a few memories of him uh, before we go into the, the content of the, the Feshrift. Uh, a Feshrift which had been brewing for a very long time before it was taken in hand by the current team who actually brought it to fruition uh, and who are, to whom we owe a great debt of gratitude for doing so. Um, and it is a shame, obviously, that Chris didn't live to see it, um, but he, his memory will live on through it, as well as all the work he did. Now, to my presentation, uh, part of my presentation, which is going to be quite short. Um, I don't know how much time I have left. There is no clock on my screen anymore. Uh, so somebody can tell me how much I've got. Uh, three, four minutes. That's fine, that's all I need. Um, lace case. Italian lace case paper binding, something which Chris had a great interest in, <clears throat> in and which I was able to talk to him about, I'm very happily so. <clears throat> and uh, I just show a picture which is not quite finished yet. I was working on it this afternoon, in fact, three minutes before uh, half past three English time, uh, which is to go onto the Legatus website for the thesaurus. And an example of what is really the, the classic Italian lace case paper binding of the 17th and 18th centuries, <clears throat> um, a binding of extraordinary simplicity and extraordinary sophistication, sophistication in design, uh, in the way that these books work. And that was something which fascinated Chris about them. And the quality of the material, this extraordinary cover paper uh, with very long fibers, very heavy uh, gelatin sizing and so on, which really um, gripped his imagination. And um, it was through his interest that I became interested in these and uh, have carried on with the work since. And I just show one picture because I, there's no point showing all the pictures that appear uh, in the, um, the publication, but this one here, the earliest that I've yet found, um, printed in Venice in 1518. It is a lace case with a rather thick cartonnage cover without turn-ins, sewn on split strap allen towards sewing supports and I'm sure pretty much contemporary with the date of printing and a very nice human touch in it. The end that some clearly, I think, rather bored student uh, studying his Ficino with the book closed, traced with a, his pen, the edge of the four edge envelope flap, which has since been lost. Um, and a, a reminder that books carry these extraordinary reminiscences of the past. Uh, and I do remember Chris very carefully pasting a squashed blue bottle back into a medieval manuscript because it's how many medieval blue bottles do we have? Um, this one got caught in the end leaves, I think it was, um, and he felt it should be preserved. So I think the, the, the his interest in these bindings is very characteristic. He saw something remarkable in them, uh, which not many other people had. Um, and when I first visited the Library of Congress in Washington, the interns were making models of lace case paper bindings. Um, not very nice ones, it had to be said, because they're being made with machine-made paper uh, text blocks, which don't work at all in these structures. Too heavy, too solid. They need a, a, a text block with a lot of air in them, uh, as you get from hand printing. But uh, that was because of Chris. So many things that we do were because of Chris. And I'm very happy that this book is now out, uh, uh, out there to honor him and his memory. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nicholas. We'll uh, uh, take uh, questions at the uh, at the end of uh, everybody's presenting, unless someone goes very shortly and we have a couple of minutes for them. So uh, for the moment, uh, thank you, Nicholas. And uh, if there were questions at the end, we'll, uh, we'll let you back. Okay. But only we have one question in the Q&A that we can take now, and then we'll uh, wrap up. And it's a question for uh, Nicholas. Uh, they uh, ask, uh, what is this, the status of Chris's archive materials, slides and notes? I remember that there was a push to raise money and digitize everything. 
Nicholas, do you have uh, some updates on that? Uh, yes, um, not much to report on recently because we haven't been able to do any work because of the, the pandemic. Um, all the slides have been digitized uh, and we are now involved in putting together the metadata, which is proving extremely uh, slow work. Um, and once we can get back into the house uh, and it'll be safe for people to visit uh, Una, who's now very elderly herself, uh, we will continue with that work well, while the money that we raised uh, lasts, we have a, a little bit more. No voice. I think you muted, Nicholas. Again, sorry. Um, did did that did did that start right from the beginning? In which case, I'll start from the beginning again. No, no, all, uh, all of a sudden, at some point, you muted. I don't know what happened. I don't know. Um, so anyway, we are we are waiting to to start again, and we have plans to try and to put the the slides in some uh, accessible form on the internet so that people can see them uh, because the we would re need to raise a lot more money. We have been in conversations with the Bodleian Library about taking over Chris's archive uh, and that happened just before the pandemic and I haven't heard anything since because I suspect no further work has been done on, on how that can be managed, but they were definitely interested. They could see that actually his archive was extremely well organized and organized in a way that would make it relatively straightforward to assimilate into a, a library collection. Um, and they've understood the, the importance, which I think was very important, of taking the photocopies of journal articles and, and odd bits and pieces that Chris had collected together over the years, because so many of them have his notes on them. And the notes, of course, are of equal value to the content. The content Bodley may have in its published book, uh, material in its own collections, but it won't obviously have Chris's notes. And they realized that that added a value to these uh, articles, which was uh, very much in excess of the originals. So I'm hopeful that that will start again as soon as we are able to get access. And it's um, frustrating not to be able to do so, but uh, we wait and we hope and we keep our fingers crossed. So uh, that is where we are. Um, it will happen, uh, but it's taking uh, sadly a very long time. But you'll be pleased to know that all the money that was raised has gone to the project and what remains will go to the project. Nothing else uh, has been done with it. So it remains dedicated. Thank you, Nicola, that's very good news. 